So once again, a very warm welcome to everyone to this special live online briefing and Q&A, and we're now ready to get started. Uh, so as mentioned, I'd like to begin by offering the floor to Dr. Ahmad Faisal Pardaus, President of Mercy Malaysia and Vice President of the PHAP Board of Directors, connecting today from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Faisal, you have the floor. Thank you, Angara. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for spending time and uh, logging on for this significant online and call-in event. And I'd like, first of all, to congratulate the uh, PHAP Secretariat for uh, putting this together with the uh, Under Secretary General's office. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Under Secretary General and the Emergency Relief Coordinator Stephen O'Brien for actually giving his precious time uh, for this event. Um, I've been party to some of the emails that have, been, that have been going back and forth between both secretariats and I know how busy he is and how he has actually had to work hard to make time for this. So thank you Under, Sec Under Secretary General for giving us this time. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, World Humanitarian Summit is less than a year away and the consultation process for regions have already concluded. As of the 31st of July, the preparatory work for the under, for the Secretary General's report that will be uh, the main document to be tabled for the summit has already begun. Mr. Stephen O'Brien um, assumed the position of Under Secretary General and Emergency Relief Coordinator in May of this year, and upon assuming that position, um, he has hit the ground running. And I know from my interactions and working together with him on the ISA principles through my other um, uh, vocation as uh, Chair Vikva. I know that he has committed himself totally to the success of this summit and has described it as a once-in-a-generation opportunity for all of us in the humanitarian sector to make a difference. So I know how important this is to him and I know that he will try to make it work, which makes it even more important for us together in this event to try and ask him and see where is his vision and where is he going to take us uh, through to this summit. It is also going to be very interesting to note that um, PHAP is an association of humanitarians as individuals. And so it will be very interesting to see how comments and questions that come through this online event, uh, whether they will be any different from any other events that have happened so far um, with regard to individual uh, expectations as opposed to organizational expectations. And so I'd like to take this opportunity again to uh, welcome Stephen on board and uh, also welcome all of you, PHAP members, as well as um, non-PHAP members who have uh, made time for this event. So Stephen, um, I think Angarat, we can uh, give the floor to, to the Under Secretary General. Over to you, Stephen. Excellent. Thank you, Faisal. And uh, now, uh, absolutely, uh, my honor and, and our honor uh, to give the floor to Mr. Stephen O'Brien, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, connecting today from New York. And uh, Mr. O'Brien, you have the floor. Uh, good morning to everybody uh, from New York. Uh, I dare say it's uh, good afternoon and good evening to many who are joining us on this very important live uh, online briefing and thank you very much indeed to uh, Ankarad Lang uh, as the Executive Director of uh, PHAP uh, and indeed uh, I'd like to thank the Federal Foreign Office of Germany for making this event uh, possible. Thank you also to uh, Ahmed Faisal Padouas uh, for your uh, introduction. I was glad to have the opportunity to, to meet you uh, in Nairobi just before I took up office uh, with effect from the 1st of June. Um, for me, uh, it's an, also an opportunity for many of you online. Uh, this is the first time I've really done something of this nature, so it's a very odd thing to have uh, so many of you uh, listening, uh, but whose faces I can't see. But it does give me the opportunity to thank you all for your deep uh, commitment and engagement uh, in the uh, humanitarian uh, world in which we are all deeply concerned and active, uh, and in particular for your participation in the preparations and consultations for the World Humanitarian Summit uh, to date, which is very much uh, live and work in progress and very much hoping that we can um, capture and use all your voices and views. So uh, this briefing uh, it gives us the opportunity to have um, uh, a real participation, but it, it does give me this opportunity to start with an important announcement 
of the new date for the World Humanitarian Summit, which will take place, I confirm, on the 23rd and 24th of May 2016 in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, that is important because those dates, as you know, had to be adjusted uh, to accommodate other uh, world events, and we wanted to make sure that we had a very dedicated slot for our vital and crucial World Humanitarian Summit. The briefing today I propose should cover an update on the regional consultation for the Pacific, which I attended, an update for the regional consultation for South and Central Asia, which concluded uh, the day before yesterday in Dushanbe, an update on other key milestones remaining, including the report and the global consultation, a brief update on the emerging outcomes of the consultations, and of course, I want to make as much time available as I possibly can for questions and answers. Um, since this is the first time I'm briefing the online community on the World Humanitarian Summit, uh, since I became the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, I would like to begin by um, reaffirming uh, what uh, Ahmed Faisal had just said, and that is, it is clear to me uh, that my um, luck is that this fantastic opportunity is already in the diary and that we already have the concept and the opportunity underway. Um, I do see it as a once in a generation uh, opportunity for us to reset and recommit and re-inspire humanitarian action and humanitarian work. And I can absolutely assure you that my personal commitment is 110% in delivering not only a World Humanitarian Summit, but the World Humanitarian Summit, uh, which is going to be uh, successful. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon, has called for the summit to generate strong global support for transformative change to humanitarian action and to initiate the process to build a more inclusive, diverse and truly global humanitarian system. So it is clear to me and I think to everybody that the World Humanitarian Summit is not and cannot be an end in itself. Uh, rather, I prefer to see it as a point of departure for the uh, consolidation and the changes that will ensure that global humanitarian action keeps pace with the new challenges and opportunities of our immensely rapidly revol uh, evolving world and that it contributes to our global efforts to lift millions of people out of suffering and ensure that no one is left behind. The World Humanitarian Summit has twin goals. First, it's clearly a historic moment in humanitarian action, and I'm determined that it should re-inspire and reinvigorate uh, our collective commitment and that of the upcoming generation of young leaders across the world, not just in some of the traditional uh, Western and Northern, but far from it, uh, the whole of the uh, various representative uh, areas of the world so that we have a joint commitment to saving lives and alleviating suffering from humanitarian crises. And the second uh, of the twin goals is that it should initiate a set of very specific, concrete, doable actions aimed at enabling countries and communities, families and individuals to better prepare for and respond to crises and to build in how much more they can be resilient to shocks as well as uh, have better preparedness. The summit itself will therefore be a platform for all stakeholders, crisis affected communities, heads of state and government, leaders from civil society, the private sector and multilateral organizations to announce their commitments to change and also to launch new initiatives and partnerships and to showcase innovative practices and ideas, the very best of the best. As the Secretary General has said, it's within our grasp to significantly reduce human suffering from crises. The World Humanitarian Summit and the consultations, uh, wonderfully inclusive as unquestionably they have been so far, very much a bottom-up, uh, multi-stakeholder approach that have preceded this uh, summit in uh, May next year, are clearly going to be a rallying cry, a rallying call uh, to this goal of reducing human suffering. So. A brief update, if I may, on the two final regional consultations ahead of the global consultation in Geneva uh, this October. On the Pacific, uh, that took place in Auckland, 30th of June to the 2nd of July. 
It was hosted by the governments of New Zealand and uh, co-chaired by the government of Australia, the government of New Zealand and uh, ourselves, uh, OCHA. The consultation was organized by a regional steering group that included the governments of the Solomon Islands, Palau and Samoa, as well as representatives of regional civil society, academia and the Red Cross movement. Uh, the meeting brought together nearly 170 participants from the three sub-regions of the Pacific, representing member states of the United Nations, including three heads of states, uh, regional organizations, uh, civil society, uh, aff affected communities, uh, national and international non-governmental organizations, United Nations agencies, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, the private sector and academia. The meeting in Auckland was preceded by 92 preparatory stakeholder consultations that involved 1,428 individuals in 17 countries representing their wider constituencies. The consultation findings were captured in a stakeholder analysis report, which is available on the WHS website, which I thoroughly commend to you. The discussions in Auckland uh, provided critical recommendations on six key issues which are identified by the stakeholder consultations. One, ensuring that humanitarian actors work closely with communities in all phases of humanitarian preparedness, response and recovery. This was identified as vital to ensure that responses build on existing community structures and networks and meet the specific needs of children, women, youth, older people and people with disabilities. Two, strengthening the role of national leadership in building local capacity to manage disaster preparedness and response. Three, responding to displacement and mitigating its consequences, particularly the displacement caused by climate-induced changes and disasters. Very much a theme of the Pacific Regional Consultation, as I'm sure you can all readily appreciate. Uh, four, collaborating to improve resilience, in particular building on the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and regional agreements such as the Strategy for Climate uh, for Disaster Resilient Development in the Pacific, the SRDP. Five, financing for preparedness, response and early recovery, including diversifying the funding base, increasing financing for disaster preparedness and climate change mitigation, and finding innovative financing arrangements for disaster response. And six, partnering with the private sector in particular with small and medium-sized enterprises, which are part of affected communities and play a key recovery in their role. And a key role in their recovery, I apologize. The meeting also provided an opportunity to hold focused discussions on the recent response to tropical cyclone PAM and highlighted the importance of long-term relationships of trust and cooperation between partners for effective response. I shall swiftly move on to an update on the regional consultation for South and Central Asia. The final regional consultation there concluded last week on the 30th of July in Dushanbe. It was co-hosted by the government of Tajikistan, the Aga Khan Foundation and OCHA. The meeting brought together more than 150 participants in, from 17 countries in Central and South Asia. The meeting was preceded by stakeholder consultations in more than 16 countries which gathered ideas and recommendations from more than 7,600 people. More than 5,000 of the people consulted were from affected communities. The summary report of the stakeholder consultations is available on the WHS website, which again, I commend to you. The preliminary stakeholder consultations identified five key themes for the South and Central Asia consultations, which were one, Localizing preparedness and response in different contexts. This emerged as the central theme of the consultation. And over the three days, participants explored questions of when and where efforts to decentralize response are most appropriate, as well as when and where centralized action led by the international community is the most appropriate. Two, ensuring that the voices and choices of affected people, particularly women, youth, and the most vulnerable, are respected and encouraged in humanitarian preparedness and response. Three, strengthening legal frameworks to ensure the protection of the most vulnerable. Four, 
implementing integrated models of coordinating and financing humanitarian and development work, particularly in some of the region's protracted crises. Five, enabling and encouraging the activities of the diverse partners involved in the humanitarian action, including the private sector. As the last consultation, the meeting in Dushanbe drew significantly on the results of previous consultations put forward uh, recommendations uh, towards the WHS. As such, the consultation examined each issue to produce specific recommendations for different humanitarian contexts, namely natural disasters, conflicts, and protracted crises. The consultation also explored several other key issues of regional and global significance, including the impacts of climate change and urbanization. The co-chair summary will be available on the WHS website shortly. So the upcoming milestones altogether, the regional consultation in Dushanbe concluded our regional consultation process. So last Friday, 31st of July, marked another important milestone for the WHS as it was the last day for public submissions of recommendations to be made to the WHS Secretariat. The consultation process through our regional, thematic and online consultations, as you all know, has been extensive and incredibly inclusive. Uh, all, all credit to everybody involved. So all in all, I'm delighted to report that so far we have consulted more than 23,000 people. Stakeholder consultations have been conducted in 151 countries. We've also conducted in-depth consultations with specific stakeholders, including youth and people living with disabilities, and have held 19 private sector consultations, targeting more than 900 participants in all regions of the world. So it's been very transparent as a process. The final reports of all these consultations and the reports submitted electronically are all available on the WHS website. So a few additional milestones now remain before the global consultation, notably the global youth consultation taking place in Doha, Qatar on 1st, 2nd September, and the last of the thematic consultations, which will take place in Berlin, Germany on the 9th to the 11th of September. With the close of these WHS consultations, we are now, and I can assure you, in the very, very intensive process of drafting the synthesis report of all these WHS consultations. The synthesis report will present the major findings of the consultation processes and highlight the action areas needed to make humanitarian action fit for the future. The synthesis report will be published by 1st October and will cons constitute the basis for the discussions at the global consultation scheduled to take place in Geneva on 14th to the 16th of October. This will be hosted by the government of Switzerland. It will bring together representatives of affected communities, member states, regional organizations, civil society, national and international non-governmental organizations, United Nations agencies, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, the private sector, and academia. Uh, the global consultation is the crescendo of the stakeholder consultations leading up to the WHS. It is a critical moment for all the stakeholders to come together and provide their perspectives on the outcomes of the consultation process and on the next steps towards Istanbul. It's also a moment for all stakeholders to begin rallying around the action areas proposed in the synthesis report and to initiate the next phase of discussions to bring these important issues forward to the WHS and very importantly beyond. So these discussions will provide important inputs to the Secretary, Secretary General's uh, report and will help inform it, which we will be aiming to be, make available as early as possible in 2016. So my vision for Istanbul is that the consultation process, inclusive, amazingly inclusive as it has been to date, uh, this very strong bottom-up uh, generation of an amazing toolkit for how we will implement uh, the future action for humanitarian impact are uh, clearly going to provide the building blocks for phenomenal progress. In addition, we will continue to make close links with and build on the post-2015 processes, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Climate Change Conference, the Peacekeeping and peace building Reviews, the uh, upcoming 32nd International Conference of the Red Crescent, Red Crescent Movement, and the high-level panels on humanitarian financing and on the global response to the health crisis, and, of course, the recently uh, concluded discussions on the whole of the SDGs and how that will be uh, launched at uh, uh, during the upcoming 
uh, UNGA. The World Humanitarian Summit, and I want to stress this, is absolutely not an end in itself. I see it as a starting point for progress. It will be clearly a platform for all stakeholders, crisis-affected communities, heads of state and government from all over the world and every region, leaders from civil society, the private sector, and multilateral organizations, not only to get on board the great reaffirmed, re-inspired determination to deliver the optimum of humanitarian action to express our common humanity, but also to announce their commitments to change and also to launch new initiatives and partnerships and showcase these innovative practices and ideas, as, as I've already described, the best of the best. Uh, above all, I would see it as a, uh, a real opportunity to re-inspire a whole new uh, generation, as well as all those who are currently so heavily committed and engaged, uh, both at a political uh, level in terms of political capital and the will of people to drive their political leaders to be engaged with this and to commit to it, but also to empower uh, local and affected communities uh, to enable them to be far more uh, able to uh, partner and be partners in the response to the crises that affect them so adversely. And so we've clearly got some emerging outcomes. The consultation process to date has been extensive and uh, now we have um, a clear uh, Im importance of the paramount uh, clarity and commitment to the humanitarian principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality and independence. Um, it's clear the consultations have called for action in several critical areas. They've highlighted the urgency of placing people at the heart of humanitarian action, leveraging local capacities where possible, according to the relative advantages of all actors and the nature of the risks in different contexts, and have consistently called for humanitarian decision-making to be more inclusive of diverse actors and to continue all our efforts to operationalize existing commitments to affected people, especially the vulnerable groups, which I have uh, listed and mentioned a few times already. Uh, the second emerging theme is that stakeholders across the globe uh, have highlighted the need to keep people safe in conflicts and address the rising human cost of conflict situations, which are the drivers of the majority of humanitarian needs around the world. The consultations have emphasized the importance of national and regional frameworks that protect people's rights to assistance and protection, in particular those who are internally displaced. Uh, clearly, we have many, many examples around the world today in which I've been deeply engaged already, even in my first two months of uh, being in the post. Uh, the stakeholders across the globe have also highlighted within this sort of second emerging theme the centrality of protection and called for humanitarian actors to work with others to combat sexual violence against women and girls. The third emerging theme and I'm nearly at the end of my introductory remarks. I'm sorry it's taken me slightly longer than I thought. But the third of these introductory, of these emerging themes are the consultations have clearly stressed the need for humanitarian action to adapt and innovate in order to cope with the new global challenges, the risks and the threats. These include uh, climate change, displacement, urbanization and demographic shifts and the new threats such as pandemics. There's been a major emphasis on the importance of preparedness, including operationalization of existing international, regional, and national frameworks for disaster risk reduction, and for a more coherent approach between humanitarian and development actors to build people's and communities' resilience to future disasters. The fourth uh, of five emerging themes is that the consultations have underscored the need for global action to address the growing gap between humanitarian needs and the resources available to meet them. The proposals and recommendations of the Secretary General's high-level panel on humanitarian financing will guide our thinking here. But I'm absolutely clear, as has been the case in every walk of life in which I've had uh, the honor and privilege to serve, uh, it is clear that if you simply ask for money without there being a clarity of a well-bought-in uh, strategy, uh, you simply have a more difficult conversation. So the importance of making sure that we get a clarity for our re-inspired strategic approach to our common humanity 
being expressed through the most effective humanitarian action globally as one of our common values and themes is by far the most powerful thing we can do uh, to seek to uh, enhance and augment uh, the resources by which that action can be delivered. And therefore, we deliver on the aspirations of the broad global community who want to share in the values of delivering humanity, uh, as I know most, uh, most across the world are keen to be able to have the chance to do. The final of the five uh, emerging themes are the consultations that have emphasized the need to close the gender gap in humanitarian preparedness and response. Uh, to get humanitarian action right, we must get it right for women and girls. And this includes working together to eliminate gender-based violence in all contexts. Many have already heard me say uh, from one of my previous lives when I was a development minister, uh, that if you get it right for girls and women up front, making them front and center of everything you do, then you get it right for development full stop. Uh, the, the same is true that if you get it right for malaria control, you get it right for uh, human uh, for health system strengthening. So it's absolutely clear uh, that we need to be able to design right up front in all our humanitarian responses, the uh, uh, making women and girls and everything that uh, affects them uh, front and center of everything uh, we do. In the same ways, it's very clear that we need to find ways of designing into our humanitarian responses the best way of breaking down the silo barriers between humanitarian and development so that we can see corn a lot of the development and the resilience aspects uh, as part of the continuum between humanitarian and emergency crisis response and the uh, uh, longer uh, haul that is uh, the partnership in development. So if I may very briefly conclude in what has, I'm sorry, taken a little longer than I anticipated, um, this is obviously a small sample of the enormously uh, wide-ranging and deep recommendations and discussions which are emerging from the consultations. And again, I thank each and every one of you who has had the chance to participate or taken an interest. In the coming weeks, uh, we'll continue to refine these action areas with the findings uh, of just uh, derived from the South and Central Asia consultation and the submissions that we've received from around the world. Representatives of NGOs and civil society actively participated, as you know, in all these regional consultations and in the process of identifying key issues for collective action and proposing recommendations. As first responders and major implementing partners to humanitarian action, uh, their full participation and inputs uh, have been and continue to be critical to make all our humanitarian action fit for the future, and where, in my capacity as the USG, it's my role to ensure that we have the optimum impact through efficient and uh, uh, well-informed coordination. So our webinar today is clearly an example uh, of our continuing uh, determination to engage uh, with all the involved stakeholders in this multi-stakeholder process, this uh, SG-led and inspired uh, World Humanitarian Summit uh, process. And we look forward to everyone's active participation in the crescendo to Geneva for the global consultation, and then from there uh, to the um, moment and the two days in Istanbul, which uh, maintaining my musical theme, I hope will then mean that we have a double fortissimo and at Istanbul, at which point we will all then uh, be able to clamber on the train with the great enthusiasm that that will be as a point of departure uh, to take forward our ability to deliver the most uh, brilliant, and up-to-date humanitarian action uh, to all the people in need and to be able to serve those who need us. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I would be very happy now, uh, I think through Ankarad, um, to have the questions moderated so that uh, uh, we don't get a cacophony of people trying to come in at the same time. So over to you, Ankarad, again. Wonderful, and thank you uh, very much, Mr. O'Brien, for this informative, uh, inspiring, and I would also say energizing um, briefing, very much appreciated uh, by everyone here. Um, and yes, it's a fantastic opportunity now to move to uh, a
uh, opportunity for Q&A. We've received a number of uh, very important questions from participants as they registered for the event, uh, many of which you have uh, answered quite efficiently in your briefing, so thank you for that. And more and more questions are coming in uh, now as, as we speak uh, through the online platform, uh, particularly regarding expected outcomes, and we'll start with a couple of questions on that, uh, but also regarding some of the specific uh, issues that have arisen uh, over the course of consultations in the past year, uh, several of which you uh, did highlight in your briefing, and uh, we can perhaps uh, ask you to elaborate on um, uh, in the next few minutes. So beginning with a couple of questions related to expectations uh, for the World Humanitarian Summit, uh, we have Ute, uh, who's connecting today from Mali, and also Jahal, who's currently based in Switzerland, uh, asking on this theme, uh, well, first, uh, just what are your personal expectations regarding the results of the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul? Um, and more specifically regarding the, the scale of expectations, should the humanitarian community expect radical changes stemming from the World Humanitarian Summit? Uh, and then a related, more specific question, uh, noting that transformative agenda has recognized issues such as early recovery or resilience as essential elements of the humanitarian response. Do you expect the WHS to reinforce this? So a uh, multi-part question, first regarding scale uh, of expectations uh, for Istanbul regarding um, radical changes or otherwise, uh, and second, specifically regarding uh, the transformative agenda, uh, having highlighted early recovery and resilience, um, and do you expect WHS to reinforce these? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Garrett. I will try and keep my answers uh, brief, as I gather there are a number of questions, so rather than uh, take up too much time. Uh, but first of all, uh, both to Ute and Jahal from Mali and Switzerland, respectively. Um, I have to say, the scale of my expectation at the moment is the best way I can describe it is off the scale. I have absolutely limitless ambition for how important this World Humanitarian Summit uh, should be. And I think we have to be both bold and ambitious. I don't necessarily mean that that means we have to uh, be so radical that we feel we're having to rip up everything that's been done in the past. Because the one thing that we start with is a platform of the most brilliant and committed humanitarian work and action that has been taking place over many years, decades, uh, from many, many actors around the world, be they uh, uh, donor agencies, UN agencies, uh, international and national NGOs, uh, many in the private sector, uh, clearly in philanthropic organizations, uh, as well as uh, uh, the very, uh, very many other stakeholders uh, over time. So I'm very clear that we should be doing our very best to capture the best of the past, to learn all those lessons, to recognize we've got a very rapidly evolving world when it comes to humanitarian need and challenge, and that therefore we should be completely open-minded and ready to both embrace change, but by no means do anything which would effectively part us from the past, because I think so much of uh, good work and brilliant work has happened in the past, we can learn from that. So at the scale of my expectations are uh, massive. Yes, there is a degree of being radical, but as I say, without tearing up what has uh, happened in the past. But in terms of being over-specific and identifying uh, beyond those sort of um, uh, six plus five areas from the two regional consultations that I was showing you were the emerging themes and outcomes, even from those consultations, which had backed onto the previous six and the thematic consultations in this magnificently inclusive process which has taken place uh, for what is an SG uh, process rather than an intergovernmental process. Uh, uh, so, of course, with uh, humanity at the center of what we're discussing, uh, it's uh, one thing we can say is uh, humanity is not actually a negotiable uh, thing. Uh, that is the aim we want to be able to deliver uh, in its inviolable way under international humanitarian law and principles, uh, wherever and however uh, humanitarian need arises so we can optimize impact. So that is why I think we need to be very careful not to foreclose at this stage. As I say, huge amounts of work is going on in the synthesis report to try and capture the very best of everything that's taken place so that everybody feels their representations and voice have been heard. Uh, but it would have been hardly a genuine uh, consultation process if I was able to delineate precisely now what the outcomes are going to be, either in Geneva or in uh, Istanbul. Uh, far more important is that it's recognized that this is a genuine and sincere process to try and build up 
all that consultative uh, consent and input, uh, as well as the very high uh, intellectual uh, effort that is going on with the work stream that is going to gather all that together in the SG report, which, as I say, uh, we're hoping to make sure we can share uh, in the very early part of 2016. Uh, in relation to the point on the transformative uh, agenda, let me be absolutely clear, uh, that remains both a valid and highly significant and important agenda, and that we need to maintain the momentum that has really been helping so many of the great improvements and clarity uh, that has uh, emerged from the transformative agenda. So far from being a replacement or a substitution, it is again to build on and to continue the work that is encompassed by, by that. So in terms of expected outcomes, I expect there to be not only a complete connection uh, with the uh, whole of the inclusive consultation process, but also with the transformative agenda. And uh, clearly we want to make sure that the structures that support that are tools to deliver rather than ends in themselves. Um, and I think that it's absolutely crucial, crucial uh, that we give the widest and, and uh, most positive context in, uh, to all those to engage in humanitarian uh, impact and delivery. Um, over, over to you again. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that. And now um, a follow-up question coming in from Raya, who was uh, who's recently returned from work in Syria and is now uh, connecting from the United States. Raya writes as follows, now more than ever, how can the international community implement its responsibility to make states exercise their responsibility to protect vulnerable populations during humanitarian crisis? What kind of collective action should the international community take if national authorities are manifestly failing to live up to their own protection responsibilities and civilians continue to suffer? Over to you. Um, well, I thank Ria for her question and particularly I'd, I'd like to pay tribute to her and indeed everybody else who have been working so hard in Syria, one of the most difficult contexts of currently the world's greatest humanitarian uh, need and uh, and thank her and everybody else for their amazing and brave work. She raises an absolutely vital point. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, the protection of civilians uh, is absolutely integral to everything that we as humanitarians do and need to do. Uh, the UN, as indeed is true uh, of everybody both in the UN family but equally in the broader humanitarian family, we can deliver uh, both humanitarian impact and to help protect civilians uh, wherever we are given access. I've just personally returned uh, in my um, eight weeks of being in office so far. I have um, uh, actually been in New York uh, the least amount of time. I've been out and about as best I can in uh, so many of the very serious areas uh, in uh, in Iraq, in South Sudan, as well as in many other places. And I'm just about to go to, to Yemen and Syria myself. Uh, it's very important that we recognize that uh, the UN, which is, uh, after all, uh, the, the ultimate uh, collection of member states, um, we need to find ways under international humanitarian law and the principles that uh, inform that, um, wonderfully uh, guarded and reaffirmed by the International Red Cross and uh, Red Crescent uh, movements uh, and, and every time you go to Geneva you're so strongly aware of how important and central that is to all of us. But it is that which gives us our authority to act impartially without impediment and having a demand for full access and to be able to protect citizens as much as we are able to deliver the commodities that give people the chance uh, to survive. And uh, I'm in no doubt that it is by going to places, using our own eyes, with our own testimony, reporting back, creating this level of accountability for uh, both uh, governments and indeed some of the um, uh, movements which are often in these internal disputes against uh, their own governments, uh, all of them create the conditions whereby citizens are at risk. Uh, I've just seen that myself in Unity State in South Sudan, in Bentu, uh, both in the camps there and in Juba and in the host communities at Nial, uh, where I visited as they were all um, coming in as hard as they could from the swamps, uh, fleeing for fear. A phrase I used was, 
they had to flee or be killed, which is absolutely the most devastating choice any of us can imagine. So uh, I'm in no doubt that Rio makes a, a very important point, uh, but ultimately this is about visibility and accountability. And uh, we should never let up in either of those aspects of our efforts. Uh, and it is vital um, in my role that I have to report uh, what I see uh, back to the Security Council and uh, here within the United Nations. Uh, and you can be assured that I will continue to always rely upon the facts as I see them. Uh, and, and I will say it as it is. And that in itself is part of uh, how we uh, can hold, hold these uh, uh, various authorities uh, to account because the protection of the civilian, the protection of citizens is integral and vital. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we now have a question coming in um, regarding uh, the specific issue of localizing response, which has been uh, an emerging uh, an emerging point, an emerging theme um, in recent months. This question is coming from Laura, who's a humanitarian strategy advisor with Oxfam. And Laura writes as follows. She says, you mentioned that local capacity strengthening and putting people at the center are core themes that have emerged in the regional consultations. However, the more global the process becomes, the higher the risk that we lose the participation of local actors. What is the World Humanitarian Summit doing to ensure that the voices of local humanitarian actors continue to be included in the process, upcoming global consultation and in the summit itself and in Istanbul? And what is the summit doing to ensure that local leadership is prioritized and reinforced in the system that will emerge from the summit. Over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed uh, to Lara uh, for that. Um, there's no question that we are all going to be able to create much greater impact and to make the resources that we have available uh, stretch much further uh, by being in genuine partnership uh, with uh, the local uh, people, the communities affected, as well as the, the institutional capacity that is both lo local and regional. Uh, of course, this is highly variable across the world and various uh, uh, people and places are at different stages of their political and institutional development and capacity. And so I think the first thing uh, when we talk about localizing response is it's not just a wholesale transfer of decision making and power. It has to be extremely sensitive to capacities and to increasing capacity as part of the designing in of our responses, which is both resilient and tailored and very uh, close uh, to, the, to the front line of action. So that's the first thing. The second is that uh, I'm encouraging as strongly as I possibly can, as I have three principal uh, constituencies uh, in my mind for the World Humanitarian Summit, first by far uh, amongst those three are the affected communities. How do we make this uh, wholly communicated and relevant uh, to them? Uh, completely plucked from uh, midair, I have in my mind uh, just by way of an example, how do we make sure that what uh, every, everything we do at the World Humanitarian Summit, how does it relate to and uh, enable, uh, let's say, a, a woman in one of the upper valleys in, uh, in one of the Stan countries, where it isn't a question of if, it is when the floods uh, or the earthquake happens. Uh, we have been, through the new technologies, able to ensure that uh, she has a mobile phone in her hand, which is fully powered because there has been an appropriate solar uh, power which has been made available to her and that this is something she's able to keep secure and that there's a dedicated satellite. So when the help is needed, whilst in the nature of these things, it would be inappropriate to say that she could ever be uh, in the position of being a customer of humanitarian uh, action, but she would be much better empowered to help call in and direct the type of uh, assistance and support indeed partnership that she needs from both the local uh, authorities and government, uh, by the local NGOs and by the international community through its uh, local, uh, through its international uh, NGOs and the UN agencies in an emergency. 
This is much easier to envisage in a natural emergency, I grant, than in conflict. And you have to understand that as I take up this post as Under Secretary General and look across all that I am now engaged with, uh, and let's say we're, we're dealing with broadly about $20 billion of humanitarian uh, need per annum, uh, with about uh, 70 to 80 million people in immediate humanitarian need, um, 80%, that's 80%, is in conflict settings. And so when I say localizing the response, we also have to find much better ways of being able to have access to the voices and the empowerment of people who are suffering as a result of conflict and conflict settings. And so um, uh, that, I hope, gives some clue to Lara of the commitment to trying to make sure that both through technologies and a commitment, if you like, even a political commitment, that we have to uh, put uh, local people and affected communities front and center, uh, that these are the themes which we're working on. But if I was to give you a complete answer now, as I said earlier, that would mean that the consultation process has not been genuine. This is what we're hoping to uh, find uh, as emerging themes will give us the concrete actions as we pull together the synthesis report and as we uh, propose uh, what will be the uh, themes and major impact for this point of departure from Istanbul at the World Humanitarian Summit where all the stakeholders, member states as well as affected communities and NGOs are able to get on board and to make happen. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. We now have a pair of questions on a related uh, related to each other thematically, uh, looking at uh, the issue of needed resources and humanitarian financing. Uh, so we have first a question coming from Abdu, who's based in Niger. Uh, Abdu writes, as the humanitarian financing is getting lower and lower, especially for less developed countries, what will be the contribution of the United Nations in securing funds in order to save lives? And a related question from Rima, who's based in the United Arab Emirates, asking, does the World Humanitarian Summit have the potential to revolutionize humanitarian financing? Over to you. Well, thank you for those questions, Abdu and Rima. Um, as I said in my remarks when we started, that there is no question the mismatch, the gap between what we need, what we would like to be able to do, what everybody needs who are brilliant at delivering humanitarian uh, action and impact uh, compared to the resources made available for them to do that, uh, is both large and growing. Uh, that makes it extremely challenging. As I also mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, it is clear to me from my various experiences in life, and I'm sure this is shared by everybody who's had to uh, work to gather funds, that if you don't have effectively uh, a result, which people who are contributing to the money can buy, rather than simply put money in as an act of faith, uh, then, of course, um, you may get it once, but it's very difficult to sustain it, and we do need sustained, repeat financing. So it's highly important that we have this very strategic, extremely results oriented approach, which is highly sophisticated in terms of being mature about the partnerships we need to create across the world, recognizing the humanitarian action and impact, uh, whilst, yes, the UN is the... Uh, ultimate expression of all the member states and the global will to make sure this happens. At the same time, it has to work in partnership with many others who are also delivering uh, tremendous uh, humanitarian impact and uh, opportunities. So uh, I think the uh, clarity is that we need to be extremely modern in our approach to partnership and recognizing that uh, uh, we have to work with rather than simply uh, expecting uh, money to flow into one uh, single uh, area. Secondly, it's absolutely vital that we uh, uh, count uh, e uh, equally validly those who supply commodities and materiel, uh, as well as those who are pledging and then converting those pledges into cash, which then enable us to uh, to uh, put the contracts in place, which uh, procure the delivery of life-saving commodities uh, and protection. Um, on the question of are we going to be able to effectively through the WHOS revolutionize uh, humanitarian financing, uh, 
I think we have to be cautious about laying up that expectation. Um, I think these are far more pragmatic things. Uh, by, the, by and large, resources do follow when people feel that there is a strategy that they both wholly buy into and have the confidence uh, that it is deliverable and will be delivered, and that what they put in will not to be diverted. So yes, we have to be extremely clear that where there is, uh, for instance, a suspicion of corruption, uh, we have to be very vocal in saying that that is both unacceptable and deeply damaging uh, to the sustainability of repeat financing, uh, and that we should absolutely hold people to account uh, for every single penny they spend. Ultimately, all this money is either philanthropic uh, or public money and is therefore wholly accountable in that way, and it is voluntary. So uh, I think the idea that there being any compulsion uh, would be uh, both counterproductive and unlikely to succeed, because again, it may possibly work as a one-time effort, but it would certainly not be sustainable. And the only thing that really matters for humanitarian impact, uh, as we look at it on this once-in-a-generation opportunity with the World Humanitarian Summit, is to find the ways that enable best humanitarian impact and action to enter, re-enter re the bloodstream of the global community as we have all through globalization become much more aware and sensitive to the fact uh, that uh, taking our humanitarian principles and values seriously, we are all global citizens but want to make the most effective contribution we can for a more dignified, uh, more um, uh, globally uh, inclusive and egalitarian uh, world of uh, survival and opportunity. So those, I think, are the principles that have to drive this. And I think if we uh, focus on the money first, then I think we'll find that's counterproductive. So um, uh, I hope that's an adequate answer to what are very fundamental questions, because without resources, of course, none of us can do anything. Um, but I think to gain those resources and to sustain those resources, we need to be extremely clear that we need to have a believable, supported, and totally inclusive strategy which people can buy into and to then share in the pride that we are delivering this uh, expression of the world's humanity to best effect. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we, of course, have many uh, excellent questions and comments still coming in, but unfortunately, we are approaching the end of our time for today. We do, however, have one more question um, that I think we can perhaps combine uh, with my invitation uh, to you to, to give uh, any closing remarks. So we can make this, uh, let's say, an optional uh, question, uh, which you may wish to take up uh, in your closing remarks. Uh, Biruk is writing. Uh, from Ethiopia, Baruch, uh, who is currently working with the Lutheran World Federation in Ethiopia, writes, there is a trend of bringing new humanitarian reforms when a new uh, USGERC is holding office. Is there any reform planned or expected under your tenancy? And, and recognizing, uh, of course, Mr. O'Brien, that it may not be um, uh, possible or appropriate to, to comment on that now, I leave it to you as an option and otherwise uh, uh, invite you to uh, provide us with any um, parting comments for today. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I can uh, certainly say to Baruch uh, that, of course, um, uh, we all uh, take up office and uh, discharge our responsibilities in whichever job we hold around the world um, in our own way. And uh, uh, whatever experiences I have been able to garner in my uh, life to date, uh, hopefully I can bring to bear on what ultimately is the uh, most fantastic and wonderful opportunity that any of us can be engaged with. And everybody I know I'm sharing this uh, webinar today are uh, all in the same uh, area of interest and activity, and that is if we can bring the greatest uh, opportunities to uh, do the very best of uh, men and women's humanita humanitarian action, their humanity to their fellow men and women, then we are part of one of the best things we can do uh, whilst we're on this planet. So um, I think it's fair to say that in all organizations today, uh, if we do not regard change as being the norm, then we're probably uh, falling behind the curve of activity and uh, institutional opportunity. Uh, what will I bring? 
Well, I will certainly, as I hope you've deter detected from what I've said, is I'm not somebody who would simply uh, dismiss or rip up what has taken place in the past. There is so much wonderful, brilliant humanitarian work, action, impact, uh, values and achievement that has been secured in the past. We must build and stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. But at the same time, we have to address the world as it is, very often not necessarily as we would like it to be. And therefore, we have to adapt. We have to change in order to marry that. And we must also always be prepared to be more and more efficient in the way we do it. it. It requires the confidence of so many who are not able to dedicate their time and their lives and their careers uh, to actually engaging in humanitarian action, but they can supply their support, be that moral or financial, in order to enable us, uh, the actors, to deliver. And so it's absolutely important that we see that as a valid and uh, continuing changing partnership as we respond to all the demands and the needs uh, across the world for humanitarian uh, action. And so, um, of course, I would fully expect that there will be some reforms, but I don't see myself uh, in, a, in any kind of revolutionary way. I think that uh, we are all always uh, evolving uh, to meet the, the modern demands and the modern needs. But above all, um, perhaps, uh, as this is my uh, closing remark, I would just like to, um, well, first of all, thank everybody who's been online and uh, participating, all those who supplied questions in writing or in uh, electronically uh, beforehand, uh, and all those who may uh, be engaged with this uh, process uh, as it closes. Thank you very, very much indeed for your commitment, your support, your dedication, and your interest in uh, delivering humanitarian uh, action and the ultimate uh, public good that we are all engaged with. It is complex, it is challenging, it is difficult because so much arises in conflict, uh, which is, by just saying that, is itself a definition of the complexity in which we have to all operate. But above all, humanity, in my view, and humanitarian action that flows from that principle and not just because absolutely crucially it exists and our authority to act exists under international humanitarian law, but humanity ultimately is something which presented properly, done well, and permanently communicated in a consultative and transparent way should and must trump everything else that goes on. It is our opportunity to make whatever small contribution each and every one of us and collectively we can make uh, whilst we have uh, our chance uh, on this earth to make a better world for our fellow men and women. And so I know that I'm joined by all of you in that enterprise. It is something which is uh, entirely worthy and worthwhile. And whilst uh, I know each and every one of us feels a sense of humility as we are mere participants in a collective whole, uh, without uh, all of us coming together to do that, and to have these discussions and these challenges as well as expectations, um, I think that we would uh, be in a worse place and the world would be the poorer for it. So clearly, my expectations for the World Humanitarian Summit, led by and supporting the Secretary General, whose initiative and commitment this is, uh, flowing from the large number of global uh, meetings and summits that there have been on a range of subjects, be they the SDGs, climate change, on financing, on development, uh, on disaster risk reduction and resilience, uh, all these uh, will be able to culminate in the way we can deliver our humanitarian impact across the world uh, in the modern setting that we find ourselves as a generation uh, facing in order to try and make the world a better place. Uh, for our children and our grandchildren. So thank you all again for uh, your support and above all for your continuing support and for helping in the process that will make the World Humanitarian Summit this once in a generation opportunity to not just to reset and to discover and to use uh, the very best of the tools and the actions available, but above all to re-inspire how humanity is at the core of everything we want to do and to achieve. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you once again. And I'm confident that I share the sentiment of this entire large virtual room as I warmly thank you for your time, uh, Mr. O'Brien, your insights today, uh, for sharing your vision, uh, your expectations for the World Humanitarian Summit, and for continuing to ensure that the questions and concerns of humanitarian practitioners and other stakeholders from all world regions are heard and addressed, and uh, for inspiring um, this community uh, that came together uh, for uh, today's event uh, and has been supporting the World Humanitarian Summit process and I'm sure will continue to do so. Um, so with that, I think uh, we'll have to wrap up this event. Um, I'd like to uh, do a round of thanks, but first to mention our next upcoming event, which will be a live online consultation looking at the issue, as mentioned uh, actually by, by Mr. O'Brien in his uh, opening remarks, uh, we're looking at the issue of gender-based violence in humanitarian crises that will be in two days uh, on Thursday this week. That's the 6th of August. You can read more and register at the link that you see there on your screen. Uh, we've again had a tremendous outpouring uh, of interest uh, for this upcoming event as well, and it's sure to be a dynamic uh, discussion. So we hope that all of you uh, will try to join us then if you're able. Uh, then to my thank yous, uh, I'd like to uh, again highlight the, uh, the website mentioned by, by Mr. O'Brien previously. Do uh, read more about the World Humanitarian Summit process and uh, join the, uh, the process yourself at this URL, www.worldhumanitariansummit.org. You can also discuss live on Twitter using the hashtag ReshapeAid. If you'd like to read more about us uh, as an association, you can read more about PHAP at www.phap.org. Uh, and then for my thanks, I'd like to uh, offer a very uh, warm thanks once again to the colleagues with the Summit Secretariat um, who have been uh, wonderful partners through this process uh, and have uh, helped to make these live, uh, live conversations on the PHAP platform possible. So thanks very much for your ongoing partnership and support. I'd also like to thank the German Federal Foreign Office for their support uh, in making it possible for uh, PHAP and the Summit Secretariat to uh, produce these live discussions throughout the summit process. Also, uh, I'd like to thank the PHAP board and the entire membership of the association for their support and active participation throughout this process, and particularly Dr. Perdaus for joining us uh, when it was uh, quite late in Kuala Lumpur, but thank you so much, uh, Faisal, for, for being with us uh, for this event today. And then finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues here at PHAP, Marcus Forsberg, uh, making everything possible behind the scenes, and Saranjana Das for her invaluable administrative assistance. So thanks to everyone, and we very much look forward to our next online meeting. This is Inherit Lang, Executive Director of PHAP, signing off from Geneva. <laughs>